want to tap that. Uh, disculpe me, uh, it, it's the train, it's not me. Uh, sorry for being late. So, uh, so again, I would like to thank Ernest for the invitation. Uh, and uh, I would like to say that I prepared something that will overlap to some extent with uh, the talks this morning, especially from uh, Dr. Cronin. Um, but I will present this also uh, uh, from the perspective of, my perspective of course, uh, as the director of the school at McGill for 12 years, too many more, too many years. Uh, I have been through uh, four accreditation process and uh, I will talk more about accreditation here. Um, but I would like to say that uh, my goal is to show that, uh, yes, there's a lot of questions that we need to, uh, to think about to, to move on. But in terms of uh, library education, uh, I would like to uh, overlap what Ernest presented this morning. Uh, we all come from the same path. Uh, McGill was among the first uh, place in North America where library education was organized. And as we know, at first, there was no formal programs. Programs were in the format of uh, apprenticeship. So this is a photograph of the apprentices at McGill, in the, in the McGill Library. Uh, we have these first programs. We, we talked about Columbia, but in fact, Columbia started, was one of the first program in North America and it was developed in partnership with the New York Public Library. Uh, McGill followed, uh, again, it was the informal, then Drexel, and then the, there's a list of uh, American programs that were developed. And very soon, we start thinking about accreditation. In the, the 1930s and 1940s, there was some uh, concerns about the uh, quality of uh, library education programs and the Carnegie, in fact, foundation, not corporation, uh, funded a number of uh, studies and the most uh, uh, known is probably the Williamson uh, report. Uh, Williamson was a, a dedicated um, man to the, the world of libraries and he wrote this report at the time arguing that there was a need to stop having library education in libraries but having library education in universities to uh, increase uh, the, um, the, the level of quality. And at the time, the American Library Association uh, became interested. I won't do the, the whole history. And at the time, the uh, ancestor of uh, the ALICE, ALICE is the Association of Library and Information Studies Educators. Uh, they became both closely interested to uh, develop an accreditation system based on, again, on the Williamson report. So basically, uh, the goal was to have more uh, university-based program, more with more management uh, competencies in it, uh, and with more quality. And of course, the notion of quality, as you may know, uh, changed over time. Uh, and uh, I'm sure there's still a discussion to have about that, but uh, so that was, uh, the beginning of the idea of accreditation. And very soon in 1948, the American Library Association came up with what should be the core competencies of uh, librarians. Uh, as you can see, there's a number of uh, items that we have uh, advocated for years, management, uh, human resource management, public relations, uh, etc. cetera. Uh, and you can see at the time, uh, the whole physical, uh, dimension of the librarian's work was very important, such as material preparation, physical maintenance, and so we moved uh, from there. Another report, well, two, two, one report and another study, in fact, uh, had tried to tackle again what should be these core competencies. Uh, so you see in the first uh, column the uh, conclusions of the Crystal, Re Keller Crystal Report, uh, in 1992, and you see on the left, on the right, sorry, uh, the Markey study uh, done in 2004. So you can see some overlap. So organization of information has been identified for a long time as a key dimension of the core competencies. Uh, again, information systems analysis, management, 
1992, research was not uh, that much seen as, as important. But so we see some, uh, some overlap. Today, um, you need to know that uh, in North America, there's, as we said this morning, about 60 programs accredited by the American Library Association. Uh, there was nine program in Canada, 51 in, uh, in the USA. Uh, and there's been an, a number of new programs. And we talked about the iSchool this morning. And interestingly, there's three programs in Canada that claims to be an I, part of an iSchool. And among the 51 programs in the USA, there's 21 uh, that are associated with the iSchool. So there's, uh, as we said and heard this morning by Dr. Cronin, uh, the iSchool is a bit of a surprise in a way because it's not, uh, it doesn't have a long history, but it is attracting already uh, an intense uh, interest in the North America and elsewhere. Of course, to put that in context, we know that uh, library programs are affected by a number of factors that force them to change. We, we know about technology. We know about the nature of the resources that we're dealing with that are changing. But we also know that budgets of libraries and of universities are changing. And this creates important need for change. Uh, program missions have evolved as well, and again, users have changed. So there's a number of factors that contribute to a need for more change. So the trends, uh, what I try to identify here are the main trends. So we talked, I think, a bit this morning about the fact that uh, many programs had to diversify. And one way of d developing diversification was to develop joint programs. So there's been a number of attempts, both in Canada and the, the United States, of new programs such as uh, Masters of uh, Information Studies and slash MBA, or Masters of Information Studies slash uh, uh, Public Affairs Masters. Uh, so there's been a growing interest to do that. Uh, is it rebranding? Is it what it is exactly? This is something that we can discuss, but surely uh, there's been a need to increase the, the spectrum of competencies. What is also very clear is that new areas have been uh, added to existing programs. We talked about knowledge management, uh, archives, user experience, HCI, information architecture, digital resources, and, and even more, uh, data mining. Uh, so there's a constant addition of new areas. And this, of course, creates, and we'll see, a number of tensions with accreditation. Uh, one, programs cannot necessarily be longer. In fact, university authorities look for shorter programs. And of course, the tension with the practitioners we mentioned this morning is also uh, more intense because the practitioners think that we need to keep everything that was taught 60 years ago plus new stuff that we need to know now. So there's, that creates a real tension. Um, there's been also a trend to develop more research-related uh, degrees. So there is a, a, a growing interest for research projects in many uh, master's programs. And of course, um, maybe you know, but I need to, to tell you that the, the typical type of program we have in North America uh, is a two-year master's program. However, there's a lot of diversity. There's one-year program, and, then, and there's some <coughs> undergraduate programs. But the main type is two-year master. And another trend, again, that was mentioned is this tension between uh, the library world and the uh, information science, information systems, information studies world. Uh, and indeed, uh, it is now um, almost impossible not to identify one programs in North America that did not change either the name of the school or the name of the degree. So it's, it's a fait accompli. We, we, we have to live with that. Um, but just more recently, uh, the American Library Association came back in trying to identify what should be the core competencies. So there's another report that was made in 2009 
And here you, we have more, but again, there's a very stable set of competencies, so we are consistent. Uh, so we have foundations, we have a focus on information resources, uh, on organization of information and recorded knowledge. Technical knowledge is seen as critical. Reference and user services, research, continuing education in uh, administration and management. So technically 60 years after the first attempt, we are uh, sticking to the same core competencies. So the question of course is, is it um, enough to, to uh, educate uh, librarians and new information professions? Because this has been uh, in a way part of the trends that in most programs there, there, there is a belief that the librarian's competencies can lead to different kinds of uh, information posi related positions. Um, so what are the issues with the programs? Well, as I said, transformation has been a major issue and the, the removal of the L word uh, has been there. There's been a, a tension between innovation and tradition. As I said, uh, this is not going uh, away and has been part of the whole uh, picture. But another issue that uh, is becoming, and I, I will link that with accreditation, is the development of online programs. Uh, of course, we can see this as a very innovative aspect, but there is more and more concern, especially because in the US there's a growing number of online programs. There is a belief that it's not exactly the same education that you have there than in programs where you have face-to-face uh, -face encounters. So that creates a bit of a, a number of questions. Um, the fact that over the last uh, 30 years, uh, universities' missions have evolved and uh, in some universities there is a clear uh, mission of doing more research and of course programs in these universities have no option to do more research, uh, but this is not equally uh, observed. And uh, so that means that indeed the the phenomenon that was raised this morning that indeed many professors in library schools, now information schools, do not have a background in librarianship because uh, when you have to hire someone, you will uh, look for people who have a publication record and a research record and sometimes and more often you have uh, that from people who come from computer science and psychology and uh, so different uh, disciplines. Um, and of course, this tension between theory and practice that was mentioned is uh, again uh, very, very uh, important. Issues with accreditation. Well, here there's no major reports on that, uh, but as the director of the school, I've been attending for 12 years uh, a meeting every year, uh, the deans and directors meeting at the uh, LEs conference every January. And I have seen, uh, and now there's more and more people starting to, to write about this, that there is a growing concern about accreditation. First of all, as I said before, the initial thoughts was to have accreditation to ensure quality. There is now uh, a belief that accreditation is there for controlling uh, the nature of programs as opposed to their quality because the ALA accreditation model is not a prescriptive model, it's a descriptive model. So we have to explain why we do things and uh, we have to give evidence of that. Um, but that, we, again, this, there is a question about does that lead to innovation really? Uh, there's been also an issue regarding standards. Standards have been fairly stable. For the last uh, 30 years, we're talking about similar standards. There's been a revision last year, uh, approved, in fact, this year, the 2015 uh, standards. Uh, the, I won't have time to talk about that, but there is a fairly big overlap between the previous standards approved in 2008 and the new standards. So there's been a lot of work for very little change in my view. There is also a tension when you, you work with accreditation, it, it's a process. So between the self-study report that needs to be done every seven years, you need to do a number of biennial reports. 
And there is a number of cases that now people are less afraid to talk about it, uh, showing that there's no connection between these two things, that people have been put on conditional accreditation because of their biennial reports, even though the self-study report was declared as a model. So that created a, a number of a big discussion, I have to say, last January. Uh, also, the tension that exists with the accreditation process is the role of practitioners versus academics. Because there are practitioners and academics on the Committee on Accreditation, and there are practitioners and academics on the external review panel. And so this is why there is a tension also between the uh, ERP and the, the COA. And of course, there is less and less, uh, well, there's less and less people who are comfortable being reviewed by professionals uh, who may be very good professionals but who have no idea how universities are run and the, 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 the missions of universities and the constraints that exist in universities. Because this is the, the, the practitioners are by definition uh, in majority both uh, at the Committee on Accreditation and on the external review panel. Uh, so that creates sometimes a bigger gap in terms of uh, understanding of what needs to be done and what needs to be addressed. Because as uh, uh, Dr. Cronin explained this morning, indeed the librarians stick to the tradition and are very uh, more interested to uh, maintain uh, the history <laughs> of what we have, where we come from as opposed to really tackle uh, the future. So I believe my time is over. So, well, I will conclude with this questions for the future. Um, this uh, debate about what should be the core competencies of librarians is a bit, uh, in my view, getting nowhere because if we really want to educate people for the future, we shouldn't talk very little about the past because the future uh, requires that we are extremely forward-looking. And I'll give you an example of that. Um, at McGill, we introduced 10 years ago a concentration in knowledge management. And I remember I had to fight to, to sell the idea. But it took literally five years in Quebec, in Canada, to start seeing advertising for KM-related positions. I don't want to uh, have uh, all the credits for that. I had developed this uh, uh, stream with my colleagues. But this is an example that we had to go really outside. And of course, we can debate what is knowledge management, which is another story. But uh, it shows that we have to be really on the ed edge if we want to innovate. We need to think what will be the resource that we will be managing. Uh, as you know, the book uh, is only one type of resource that we have to manage now, and tools are constantly changing. Nobody saw a few years ago the impact of the mobile phone on uh, information behavior and information retrieval. So we need that kind of task force to look at the future. But what is very often missed in discussing these things is the challenges of higher education right now, especially in North America, but from what I understand in Europe, it's the same thing. Universities have to change, not only libraries. And uh, so what, will, what kind of programs we will be able to afford is a big question. So that calls for change management, but how can we make change? Indeed, is, is always difficult because nobody knows the future. And, and in changing, how do we ensure uh, quality management, which should be, of course, as educators uh, and as researchers, uh, a very important focus. So these, uh, I, hope, I hope the table is put for some discussion. Uh, but all that to say that, uh, in my view, we need th that kind of conference is very welcome because we need to to have more heads to think about these things, and uh, we it would be great if we could have uh, a task force internationally created 
to, to really look forward for what uh, is the future. So, thank you. <laughs>